Hi, it's Dr. Risa E. Lewis dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adara Landry and I wrote. It's called Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book coming in 2024 by HarperCollins. Pre-order now, Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact, wherever you buy your books. To not have regrets when you're dying, to live a meaningful life today, invest wisely. And so my audience started as a very financial audience, and we know all about investing wisely and compounding in this idea of planting the tree today so that in 20 years, it will grow into this beautiful sprawling tree. Well, I wanted people to look at their non-financial investments the same way. If you start building that life today, and you still have to be mindful of things like your financial framework, but if you start doing that today, it will keep blossoming. And, And people often ask me, tell me the keys to dying a peaceful, wonderful death, right? Because I'm around that all the time. And I say, well, the keys to having a wonderful, peaceful death is to have a wonderful, peaceful life. This is the Visible Voices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Risa Lewis. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Jordan Grummet. Jordan is a hospice doctor, an author, an entrepreneur, and a subject matter expert in personal finance. The focus of our conversation is on finance and on finding a road to freedom. We discuss Jordan's book entitled Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. Let me give you a little bit of a background on Jordan. He was born in Evanston, Illinois in 1973. His interest in becoming a doctor was ignited when his father, an oncologist, died unexpectedly in the prime of his life. This profound loss not only inspired Jordan to practice medicine, but also has given him a unique perspective as a financial expert, challenging him to think deeply and critically about concepts like wealth, abundance, and financial independence. After graduating from the University of Michigan, Jordan received his medical degree from Northwestern University and began practicing internal medicine in Northbrook, Illinois. He's currently an associate medical doctor at Journey Care Hospice. So when we get to the conversation, Jordan and I are launching in talking about his background in hospice medicine and how he saw shade into personal finance. You and I have the experience, although different time frames, of sitting with people in their final minutes, in your case, final hours. And you know, you share in your book some of those stories and the lessons. And in fact, I'm going to read in a minute, Top Five Regrets of the Dying. But before that, I'm wondering, in the last month or so, so maybe something you haven't written about and fully processed, can you share a patient scenario, a story that sort of struck you, stood out, is was a little different than perhaps the others that you've now accumulated over the years? Well, one patient in particular, and it really struck me is, When I started in hospice a number of years ago, we had a lot of Holocaust survivors. And so it was not uncommon. The area I live in actually has a lot of people who came to the U.S. after the Holocaust. And it's just a different experience taking care of Holocaust survivors. Their issues are different as they get closer to death. There's a lot of post-traumatic stress syndrome and a lot of issues that they deal with. And one of the probably last... Holocaust survivors that I took care of pretty recently, it was interesting because she kept on having near death experiences, but it was almost like she couldn't let go. And it really hit me this idea that this is a person who was a true survivor, right? She was a little girl during the Holocaust. This is a long time ago. And now as she was getting to the end of the life, we kept on thinking that this, you know, she's very terminal. She had a cancer that had spread. And every time we thought she was going to die, She would look like she was on her last breath and then she would rally. And the next day she would be talking to us again. And this happened over and over again. And it really hit me as very profound that this person who must have been such a survivor in the most difficult of times, all these years later, it was like she knew it was time to go, but I don't know if her body could let her. And it was just very profound to experience that. And she eventually did pass, but it was after multiple of these episodes where she we thought she was going to, and then she didn't. Remarkable, profound, and great, great, great share. You and I both resonate with this concept of trauma, post-traumatic manifestations, and inherited trauma. 
do you think that, say, when you've taken care of patients that are Holocaust survivors, that they have those same top five regrets of the dying that you've listed in your book? So the top five regrets of the of the dying come from Bronnie Ware, right? So she's actually very famous, wrote this book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And I talk about them in the book. I think they are. And, you know, I often add this idea that it's not just regrets, but I like to look at it as investments, right? So I'm in the financial world. So I think we regret when we didn't invest ourselves in the right things. And I'm not talking about stocks and bonds here. I'm talking about things like education and things like our hobbies and things that felt purposeful to us. And so the way I look at her regrets as I frame it a little different is that I think we regret that we didn't invest ourselves in those things that were utterly important to us. And there's always a reason why not to. Maybe it didn't make us money. Maybe we didn't have the courage. Maybe we just thought we didn't have time and we pushed these important things off yeah. for so long. And then we get to the point where unfortunately we're on our deathbeds, we're terminally ill and we realize that it's too late. We can't go back and rewrite that story it's already passed. And so a big thing for me, one of the wonderful boons of dealing with people at the end of life is that I think a lot of us young people can really learn from what they're going through and start investing today. We, we love in the investing world to talk about compounding interest, this idea that if you invest when you're 20 or 25 or 30, that money's going to grow and compound over time. And then by the time you're in your 50s, it's going to be worth a lot more well, I really think that memories and experiences and investing wisely in yourself and your community and the things that are important to you, I believe that also compounds too. And so at your deathbed, instead of having regret, you have a wealth of life experience instead that compounded over the years. Yeah. Listeners are wondering what these top five regrets of the dying are. So let me read them. Number one, I wish I'd had the courage to live a true life to myself, not the life others expected of me. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And number five, I wish I had let myself be happier. And I think these regrets particularly resonate with physicians. The delayed gratification of training, this concept of servant leadership, I've described the healthcare system and training, and then if we stay in particular academics, that it's sort of sadomasochistic, and we're really good. We're really good at, at being, you know, people are like, Risa, I'm not a masochist. I'm like, no, no, I know. But this system and what it requires of us, it means that we're kind of buying into like a way of acting that, you know, the sadistic aspects of the asks of us really require us to behave and complete our tasks, which many of us do very, very, very well. You know, I feel like we spend a lot of time living up to other people's standards. And so as young kids, I think we have the freedom to dream and to think in big audacious terms. But as we get older, we're really discouraged from that, right? Our big dreams turn into what am I going to do for a living? How am I going to make money? And society and the rest of the world starts pushing in on us and telling us who we should be and what we should do. And it's a very strong effect on us for the rest of our lives. And we carry these ideas of what we think we should do, or nowadays what social media tells us what we should do. We should have the outsized vacations, you know, exercise until we have the perfect bodies, wear the perfect clothes and spend money <laughs> to do all these huge, important things. And so we always are having other people dictate to us who we should be and sometimes, unfortunately, it takes something like a terminal diagnosis to realize that that stuff was all being told to us, but it wasn't necessarily what we wanted. So if you look at these regrets of the dying, it has nothing to do with what we've accumulated or what our job is, you know, or how, how high or elevated our title is. It all has to do with all those things that I think we started thinking about when we were children and somehow we let go of as we got older and quote unquote more mature. Yeah. You shared with the audience that traumatically, unexpectedly, your father, who is a physician, died when you were seven years old. And so I'm wondering if you can share your financial history in that way from that frame forward. Well, my father died when I was seven. I cosmically felt like it was my fault. And, and seven-year-olds, that's how we look, right? We look at the world through a very self-centered lens. And so I believed my father died because of me and it took me some time, but I eventually came to the conclusion, the way to make up for this 
was to become a physician like him. If I stepped into his shoes, I could cosmically fix this horrible thing that happened to me. And so it became a true life goal. So when you talk about finances, for one, I never thought about finances. So I was lucky enough to live in a a strongly middle upper class family. So I didn't have to worry about the moment to moment, but money was never on my mind. My true goal was to fix this bad thing that happened to me when I was a kid by becoming a doctor. And that was really the idea that led me throughout most of my childhood. As I started practicing medicine and started burning out and realizing that maybe this was the dream of my father and not my own. I had much loftier dreams, things that I had always put aside, like being an author, um, like creating content and being a podcaster. Back then, I would have thought more about radio than being a podcaster because that wasn't as big of a thing. That was when I started thinking about my finances. Now, I was lucky enough, again, to have grown up in a family that could provide for me, so I didn't have a lot of debt. And then, of course, I stepped into a job where I could make reasonable amounts of money. and so. That was when I had the, in a sense, the epiphany that I've been given this gift of having the ability to make money, but I'm not using that money as a tool to live the life I want to live. And so I became very thoughtful about finances at that point. It's when I discovered the financial independence movement and this idea of how we can manage our money to live the lives we want to live. And that was when I realized that being a doctor was a great mechanism to accumulate money and was very purposeful for a lot of that childhood and even young adulthood, but no longer felt purposeful. So why not then use this money that I've accumulated to start doing the things that did feel more purposeful? I ask about this because one of my guests was Janelle Espinal, who's been on your podcast. And we were talking about personal finance and sort of our upbringing regarding finance, like our financial history, and to that point, financial health. And my upbringing was a very traditional type of household where father breadwinner, mother, stay-at-home mom with us. And boys were supposed to know about finances and learn and provide, but girls didn't need to worry about that. So I lived scared most of my childhood, adolescence, and early career because I knew I didn't know. So I did the like live way below my means. And then I did what you started doing, which is educating myself, you know, reading, watching, listening, talking. And now I'm so glad to be able to podcast about this because I think it's something that we all can do. And it's a way to, to bring in the doctor aspect, be healthy and help people be healthier. So let's go into a bit more granular, the financial aspects. I'd love to know what being financially free means to you? And just generally, what's a good working term with the listeners so we can think about what financial freedom means? So financial freedom to me is this idea that money supports the decision and the life we want to live as opposed to we're living the life we have to live in order to accrue money. And so a part of that is financial independence, this idea of getting to a place where you have enough money to pretty much live a life full of purpose, identity, and connections. In other words, you can do the things you want to do for most of the hours of the day. That can look like very many different things. When I first got into personal finance, I thought that meant having so much money invested that that invested money could support you for the rest of your life and you could quit your job. As I've evolved and I've thought more about it, I realized that that's not necessarily the only take. That's one take, and that's what we call the traditional financial independence or FIRE movement started on this whole idea of let's accumulate a lot of money and quit work. I've now started to think of it as many other things. For instance, if at the beginning of your career, you find a job you love and that job pays you enough to manage your daily life, in a sense, you've really hit financial freedom and financial independence right there. And then you don't have to accumulate a huge amount of money. That's one way. There's another path too. A lot of people, for instance, buy real estate and they don't love real estate, but they buy enough so that it creates enough cash flow so that they can spend most of their hours doing other things. And I think that's a way to get to financial independence too. So I think financial freedom is more of a mindset, this idea that I can do what I want to do and money's not going to hinder me. And then financial independence is actually the tactics, how you build your financial life in order to do those things you want to do. Great. FIRE is an acronym, audience listeners, uh, F-I-R-E. And Jordan, can you tell us about FIRE and any other important acronyms in this space? Ah, there are so many different acronyms. So FIRE is Financial Independence Retire Early. 
It's something that people have talked about at least five, financial independence, for centuries. But it became a big thing probably in the late 90s, early 2000s, when Vicki Robbins and Joe Dominguez wrote a book called Your Money or Your Life, which talked about this idea of accumulating enough money and using that money as life energy to do the things you wanted to do. In other words, not to be beholden by your money, but have that money help you live the life you want to live. So at that time, there were a lot of young, especially tech-oriented, mostly men who were interested in this idea of, I hate my job, let's find a way out. So I'm going to accumulate a lot of money, invest it wisely, and live off of that money. Things have changed over the years. As the FIRE movement has evolved, first and foremost, very few people are interested in retiring nowadays because they find that once they have the freedom to do what they want, they start doing things they love to do and happen to make some money doing those. So really, people aren't interested in the retire early anymore. And they're also realizing, as I was talking a little bit about, is that you don't actually have to get to that number to live the life you want to live. So there's all sorts of new things like slow fi and coast fi. And as opposed to going into the details of all those, it's this idea that we can start living that financial independence lifestyle today, even if we haven't hit our number yet, by being really intentional about how we save and how we structure the time we spend making money. And so that's the idea yeah. is that really we found ways to improve financial independence so you don't have to wait decades to get there. I'm Dr. Risa E. Lewis dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adair Landry and I wrote. It's called Micro Skills: Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book being published in April of 2024 by HarperCollins. We believe every future goal, complicated task, and healthy habit can be broken down into simple, measurable, and tiny skills that you can practice and then excel by removing obstacles, overcoming assumptions, and maximizing your potential at work and in life. You can pre-order it now. Go to bookshop.org, amazon.com, or wherever you buy your books. Now, you run a mastermind, and I'm wondering if you can share with the listeners a little bit about that mastermind and how you've seen it help people that join, but also how has it helped you? So it's the Wealth with Purpose uh, Mastermind. And what I found when people listen to my podcast, Earn and Invest specifically, there were a lot of people who were very much like me. What that meant is a lot of us were young professionals. We had made enough money to start having some choices in life, but we're really having trouble going from financial excess to living the life we wanted to live. So we would look at our jobs and say, well, it's not exactly perfect. I'd like to change some things here. We'd look at where we live or who we live with or how we're living and realize that it wasn't exactly filling us up the way we would hope it would. And what I realized in my own personal journey is when I got to that place, when I started understanding my finances and I started to tactically understand the right actions to take to become the person I wanted to be, guess what? I couldn't take action. Even though I knew what I needed to do, it was extremely anxiety provoking to take the next step. So the idea behind the Wealth With Purpose Mastermind was to get a bunch of people who are in the same place and create a community in which we could support each other through action so that people could go from the theoretical to the active process of changing their life. And I I knew this was important because that's what happened to me. When I got to that sticking place, I went to something called a Camp Fi. It was a conference where 40 or 50 of us got together and I met some other physicians as well as some other people interested in financial independence. And their support really gave me some of that strength to start taking action. And so that was what I was hoping would happen with the mastermind. And indeed, we've been doing it for about six, seven months And already a number of the people in the group have either left their jobs or changed their jobs or have started building in parts of that life they want to live today as opposed to putting it off. And I don't know if I've learned something new, but I'd say it's definitely strengthened this idea that, you know, winning the game, I used to think winning the game was having enough money. And once I got there, I started to say, well, the money is great, but you really want to live a life of purpose. And I, in my book, I talk about purpose, identity, connections. And so I started saying, winning the game is understanding your purpose, understanding your identity. I've now again evolved even to one further point. The reason you do all this and understand your purpose and identity and get your money together is actually the connections in the community you build. And so when I do things like this mastermind, I realize that this community of people that I build around me is the closest thing that I can get to happiness, right? We, we all disagree what happiness is versus contentment versus Maslow talks about life actualization and 
You know, the researchers who study happiness, happiness talk about life optimization or quality of life. There's all sorts of things we talk about, but the same idea holds true is how do we feel fundamentally like we are using this little precious time we have to do important things? And I found that community definitely gets me closer to that than anything else I've done. Love it. Listeners who are a bit skeptical, you know, I grew up upper middle class, you grew up upper middle class, we're both white. What about people that are like, they're not talking about me. This is not my world. I don't have inherited wealth. I don't have assets. And I have maxed out credit cards with lots of loans from school. I often think, thank goodness I chose emergency medicine because to your point, it provided benefits and a salary that got me out of some of my loans. I had loans when I finished my training and, you know, but I was able to, with my fear of of finance and living way below my means, also just paying those off. But, you know, I think what you and I are speaking about, there is a large percentage of the U.S. population that say, you know what, this doesn't refer to me. This is not achievable for me, privileged white people. So there's no question, right? I grew up in a very privileged place and I was incredibly lucky to be there. And there, and there's no other way about it, right? So putting that on the table, it's true, but we all are in the situation we are in. And hopefully the idea is how can we make that situation better regardless of where we're starting? So what I often tell the people who say exactly that, said, well, you have or had a decent amount of money. You had some privilege. There's a lot of ways that you were able to get ahead. I always kind of say, well, it is true. And money is a really valuable tool, but it isn't the only tool. And so what I really try to help people who are not in as privileged places as I am hopefully work on is, well, how can you then leverage those other tools that you have? Because money is only one of many tools and you have goals. And to get to those goals, you're going to use your tools. So what other tools do you have at your disposal? So I often talk about someone who's, let's say you're 22, 23, maybe you dropped out of college, maybe you just got through college, couldn't find the job you want and are working and hustling at an eight to six or a nine to five. And this is not your ideal job, but you're doing what you have to do. Well, what I always point out is young people have tools that I don't have. So for instance, you may have your youth or your energy, or maybe you're not married yet, or maybe you don't have a mortgage. Maybe you have other communities that you're already involved in. So the question is, how can you start using those tools and leverage them in the absence of having excess money? So for young people, for instance, I say, look, the goal is to spend as much of your precious time as possible doing things that are purposeful and important to you, right? And hopefully as time goes on, we replace a lot of our time doing things we loathe and replace it with things we love. So if in your 20s, you're at the beginning of this journey and you're working an eight to six and you're just scraping by, but you have the tool of youth and energy that I as a 50 year old don't have nearly as much of. So maybe what that looks like is on the weekends, you start doing a passion project, maybe one that could even make a little money, a side hustle. So you're working eight to six, Monday through Friday, maybe on Sunday from 12 to four, you spend four hours a week doing something purposeful and exciting to you that might make money. And then you do that for six or 12 months and see what happens. If you do start making money, maybe that gives you a little margin to start pulling back on that eight to six and doing it nine to five, or maybe working four days a week instead of five days a week. That's the greatest situation. And maybe you build that over time and you get even more margin. And that's that process of building in more time, doing things you love and getting rid of things you loathe. But let's say at six to 12 months, you do this and you don't actually make any extra money. Well, you still spend four more hours a week doing something purposeful, something important to you. And so I think you win either way. Don't get me wrong. I'm not Pollyanna about this. I don't think it's easy. But the key is how do you leverage those other tools when money is not what's available to you? Do you believe the phrase, do what you love and the money will follow? You know, to some extent, I, I mean, I love this idea that we can all do things that we're passionate about and it's going to make us a lot of money and we're going to do wonderfully. The truth of the matter is sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And it is somewhat of a myth, I think, in American society that, oh, all you have to do is go for what you love. Well, the truth of the matter is sometimes what you love is not what you make a lot of money at, but what you are okay with makes you a lot of money. I realized pretty soon into my career, I love writing but probably wasn't going to make me as much money as being a doctor. I was really good at being a doctor. So in this case, I was intentional about this idea that maybe I'll be a doctor for a season of my life, 
and I'll use that to make money and then leverage that money I now have as a tool to start backing off and living the life I want to have. The other problem is when we tend to make money doing the things we love, it sometimes can kill the excitement or the passion in doing the thing. So I often talk about when I was early in my career, I started selling artwork. I was buying artwork for a new condo I had bought and I fell in love with this artwork. But when I went to the galleries, every painting was $2,000, which was way too expensive on my resident salary. So I went to eBay and found that I could buy some of the same paintings for much, much cheaper. And I turned it into a business. And so a year or two into it, I was selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of artwork, but something strange happened. I stopped loving the artwork when I started making money on it. All of a sudden, I was getting hundreds of paintings going through my condo and it started being paper. I would just, someone would send me a piece of paper. I would then ship it up and send it to someone else and they'd send me a little money and I'd make a little profit. And so what I realized quickly is sometimes the act of making money, doing something you're passionate about actually kills your internal motivation to do it. So I don't think you have to love what you do, but I think you have to know what you love so you can then build the financial framework around that. And that's going to look different for every person. For some people, that's going to look like getting a job in that field. But for other people, it's going to look like getting a job that supports you so you can spend your free time or eventually your retirement doing those things. I love that story about the art. I worry about my friends that have uh, sneakers as a passion that flip sneakers to buy and sell. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how much money you can make with sneakers, by the way. (laughs) From your book, uh, you talk about these items. I'm going to ask you, what are your time wasters? How do you create time abundance? And what are your work bursts? So time wasters is probably the most difficult because I now actually, where I am in life, I don't look at things nearly as much as time wasters as I used to. So now if I sit down and watch, you know, Netflix for an hour, I kind of do it intentionally and it's something I like and it entertains me and I kind of accept that for what it is. But I think there are lots of ways for us to be more efficient with our time. And some of this depends on who you are and what your personality is and what works for you. So I found for me, for instance, I could be much more efficient with my time if I started early in the morning, right? So I would wake up at 4.45 every morning and I would do some of my most difficult work in the morning because no one else was awake And I was a busy doctor, which means I had a pager at the time and I was getting paged at all hours of the day. But generally between, you know, 4.30 and 7 in the morning, no one really bothered me. And so it was a a time that I could basically spend and, and restrict it to being very, very thoughtful about what I was doing. And so I think that's one means of efficiency. The other means of efficiency is starting to get rid of useless tasks. So a big thing for a lot of us, for instance, is managing our email and managing our meetings. And right, so finding mechanisms to cut down on your email, having automatic return emails that helps clarify what needs to be managed now and what should be managed later, getting rid of meetings that have no value. I mean, any of us who've ever been in academics know that there are meetings upon meetings upon meetings, and only a small percentage of them actually move the needle forward. So especially if you have the power, getting rid of those meetings. And then last but not least, we, we mentioned work bursting. I found for me, and I think this works for a lot of people, that we tend to do our best work in very concentrated bursts of time. And so I'm a creative. I like doing creative things like writing and podcasting. So I'm very intentional about setting an hour, maybe two at most aside for very intensive work. And then after that, having lots of downtime, free time to do things a little more enjoyable or physical that get me out of my mind, and then coming back and bursting again for short periods of time. So I think if you're lucky enough to be freed from that restrictive at nine to five work routine, then you can use mechanisms like bursting to be just super efficient in short periods of time, and then use that other time to do other things, exercise, rest, meditate, whatever it is you do that you really like to do. Uh, But that doesn't require as concerted energy. You and I are similar. I'm an early riser. And of course, part of it, I read the, the works on efficiency and brain and, you know, getting right up and getting right to some of the stuff that requires a lot of active intention, be it writing, be it, I don't know, fill in the blank. It's good rather than later in the day when you might be a little tired. And to that end, I, a co-author and I wrote an article about why early morning meetings actually interrupted that sort of deep work focus. And if you're an exerciser, if you have a family at home that you need to get up and out to school and things like that, why early morning meetings really didn't work for a lot of people. And 
it seems the way you structured the book, it was towards the end that you wrote a chapter on investing in yourself, yet arguably that's sort of the underlying foundation of the book and your life mission and, you know, your philosophy. So why wait to the end to write on that? You know, I really felt like I needed to establish a few things before we got to the key message. One thing to really establish, and I think we really start there in the beginning, is this idea of purpose, identity, and connections. That a lot of us start with money first, and the problem is that never ends. We just keep on that kind of treadmill of worrying about money, worrying about money, and worrying about money, and we never get off. So kind of the first real big key lesson I wanted to tell people is, look, we've got to start with purpose, identity, and connections. The next big message was just because you've started with purpose and identity doesn't mean that you can't build a financial framework to support those things. So once you know what purpose looks like in your life, you then can make some of those intentional decisions about how you want your financial life to be and build that financial framework. That's when I felt really the audience was primed to talk about what we're doing all this for, right? So that's the pot of gold. And the pot of gold to not have regrets when you're dying, to live a meaningful life today is to invest wisely. And so my audience started as a very financial audience and we know all about investing wisely and compounding in this idea of planting the tree today so that in 20 years, it will grow into this beautiful sprawling tree. Well, I wanted people to look at their non-financial investments the same way. If you start building that life today, And you still have to be mindful of things like your financial framework. But if you start doing that today, it will keep blossoming. And and people often ask me, tell me the keys to dying a peaceful, wonderful death, right? Because I'm around that all the time. And I say, well, the keys to having a wonderful, peaceful death is to have a wonderful, peaceful life. And so we have to start planting those seeds much, much early. And that's why I felt like that was really the crescendo of the message and why I left it to the end. Because I felt like if we didn't concentrate on those other things first, we wouldn't be ready to realize what we were building towards. What have been some of your worst investments or where did you make some poor choices with your investments, whether that's people, whether that's resources, whether that's money? Oh, I mean, there are a million, right? So let's talk about the first financial one, right? So, you know, whole life insurance, something I invested in very, very early was a a horrible investment. My grandmother lived close to us towards the end of her life and she got sick and ended up staying at a sunrise assisted living. And I remember the only thing I knew about investing as a young man was people always told me invest in what you know. So my grandmother went to sunrise assisted living and I'm like, oh, I love this place. They're totally taking care of her. So I took all my Roth IRA money and put it in sunrise assisted living, which was no huge loss. But 10 years later, it was worth no more than when I started. That was before the days I understood about index investing and kind of following the market, which is a much better way to invest. So I made all sorts of financial mistakes. But I also made lots of mistakes when it came to my life and career. For instance, the first patients I ever saw my first week of medical school was volunteering for hospice. I knew that hospice was important to me. And yet for some reason, I felt like I had to go on and leave hospice medicine and do just about everything else and only come back to it later in my career. So I often talk about how I burned out in medicine and I was lucky enough to have accumulated enough money that I could step away from it. But if I had been knowledgeable enough about my sense of purpose, I might have started with hospice medicine. I probably wouldn't have accumulated nearly as much money, but I wouldn't have had the need to quit. I probably wouldn't have burned out and I would have had a much longer career in medicine. So I made lots of mistakes. I mean, I always knew I had the inkling that I wanted to write. I mean, I've been writing since a little kid, poetry, stories, et cetera. And I had always told myself, that's not what adults do. That's not how you make money. Being a doctor is how you make money. So, you know, I ignored this very important thing in my life. And what I always laugh is, if you now Google my name, the first thing that Google puts up at the top, because it gives you kind of like a moniker, it says author. And to me, when I first noticed that, it was one of the most proud moments of my life. And it hit me that this thing was so important to me for all my life. And I probably was completely ignoring it because I had just told myself, maybe I didn't have the courage because I thought I would fail. Maybe society told me that being a doctor was much more important than being a writer. I'm not sure what it was, but it was a mix of all those things. And I now feel so lucky that I didn't ignore it until I ended up on my deathbed that I had the courage to actually change my life and start pursuing something that was deeply and fundamentally important to me. You've shared with the listeners about you and about your journey and about maybe this 
not listening to yourself, but then ultimately trusting your gut, listening to your gut. And when I have mentees, when I have friends, when I have anybody in my life about whom I care, and even what I say to myself is trust your gut, trust your gut. And it sounds like you came to trusting your gut. The book to me, as I read it, I could not help but think that this was a bit of a therapeutic exercise and a therapeutic gift to yourself to close the circle, put your your relationship with the death of your father to rest and to really be like, this is done, I'm done, and I'm going to move to my next step, my next season, my next chapter. How does that resonate with you? It definitely does. And, you know, dealing with the death of my father is something I always think I'm done with and I always come back to. And so if you ask me, well, when did you really deal with the death of your father? My mom would say, actually, right when he died, I started asking her questions like, what happens if you die? What, who's going to take care of us, et cetera? So my mom would say, boy, you really started dealing with that right away. I don't even remember that. That was when I was seven or eight. Then I would say, well, when I was in college, there was a time when I really, at the age of about 18 or 19, really kind of came to terms with it and, and came to terms with who I was and started feeling like I was okay, that I wasn't the cause of this disastrous thing that happened to me. And then I thought I had kind of come to terms with it. And then I was, uh, you know, a middling doctor and realizing that this thing that I thought was so important to me, I was no longer connecting to. And I had to make this decision to walk away from medicine. But in doing so, I was walking away from the one little wisp of a connection I still had with my father. So again, I thought I was dealing with it then. And then I write this book. And again, I realize that a lot of this book is not just a message to people about my life and what it says about money and life, but a real reckoning of who I became and why and how I now have transitioned from that person to someone else. So, you know, I keep them thinking I come to terms with it and I'm sure in 10 years, it'll be something else. I think it will be one of the traumas of my life. And I think I'll probably spend a lot of time looking at life through that lens and trying to understand why I am the person I am. But I also think that there's something beautiful and okay with that. Like, I think we all have our traumas and each person's trauma is unique and personal to them. We can't walk in anyone else's shoes. We only walk in our own. And so that's part of life's struggle is for us to deal with those early on traumas we had and make sense of them. And in fact, You mentioned briefly, and I've started working on my next book called The Purpose Code, and a lot of that has been thinking about what happiness truly looks like. And a lot of happiness, I think, breaks down into both meaning and purpose. And meaning is actually the cognitive process of looking at your past and coming to terms with it. And so that's what I think I do with my fathers. I'm continuously retelling the story of Jordan Grummet and his life and what that story has meant and refining it over the years based on new information and rewriting the narrative. And I think that's if, when we're at our happiest, I think we are continuously rewriting our childhood narratives and becoming more and more the hero of that story. And so I think this book for me is is part of that process. I don't want it to be 100% self-centered. I hope actually what it also produces is a lot of helpful information to other people, but it, it is also part of my personal process. Risa Lewis often speaks about Risa Lewis in third person, so she really likes that Jordan Grummet just talk about Jordan Grummet in third person. <laughs> I, I don't often, but occasionally I'll, I'll jump to third person. So. No, she loves it. She loves it. Jordan Grummet was recently interviewing a guest on his podcast, and he asked this very astute question that then Risa Lewis wrote down with the intention of asking Jordan Grummet. So here it is. How did this book change you? I believe that for the first time in my life, I had actually self-actualized in the sense that all these years, I think being an author was what I truly wanted to be. And I think writing this book turned me into that. I had self-published a number of books, mostly a number of blog posts. Blog posts I'd written, I had a long time blog about medicine. So I'd written a thousand, thousand five hundred blog posts. And so I had accumulated bits and pieces of those and put them into self-published books. But for my brain, the standard was traditional publishing. And so this book profoundly changed me in that sense that I think for the first time, I really felt like I had turned into that person that I so wanted to be throughout most of my life and yet hadn't had the courage to pursue. For listeners that want to hear more, learn more and follow you, what's the best way to get in touch? So the easiest way is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. Of course, you can learn about the book, Taking Stock, and learn how to buy it there. Uh, But also there is 
basically three ways in my life I've created content, at least obviously, right? The first is I wrote a medical blog from the early 2000s to about 2016 called In My Humble Opinion. You can find the link there. I also wrote a financial blog called Diversify. Uh, You can find the link there. And last and not least, what I spend a lot of my time doing today is the Earn and Invest podcast. And the links are all at jordangrummet.com. The Risa Wrap Up. Special thanks to Jordan Grummet for joining me in conversation. I really appreciate the time you took. Audience, a few take-home points. Number one, financial health and wellness is health and wellness. So start thinking about it and reframing finances in this way. Number two, all of us should be seeking our paths to joy and freedom. The role money plays in that is a bit controversial. Not everybody will agree. But if you do what you love, if you listen to that which gives you joy, I think you're going to be walking on the right path. And finally, number three, finances and financial education and literacy. You can read, you can watch, you can speak. There are many ways to learn more and many ways to work towards your own independence. That's all I have for you this week, audience. See you next time. The Visible Voices podcast amplifies voices both known and unknown, discussing topics of healthcare, equity, and current trends. We are a production of the People's Media Network. Our team includes Dr. Giuliano DePorto and me, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. Please find me on social media at Risa E. Lewis and through the website, thevisiblevoicespodcast.com. If you like the podcast, please rate and review us. Share the podcast with a friend today. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, to be continued.